those that don't know me, my name is Jacques Jabez. I teach at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, our guest today is Sir Jeremy Greenstock, director of the Ditchley Foundation, which is a job he's been doing since 2004. Before I introduce him, maybe let me say a few words about the organization he leads. Uh, the Ditchley Foundation was established in 1958 to advance international learning and to bring transatlantic and other experts together to discuss international issues. It has an American and Canadian sister institutions, and whenever, as, as soon as I found that out, of course, as a Canadian, I went to look, you know, who's on the board of this institution in Canada, and it really reads a bit like who's who of Canadian bureaucracy, politics, and business. So uh, this is a very legit institution, obviously. The Ditchley Foundation holds approximately 12 conferences a year, almost all of them at Ditchley Park itself. The conference program is uh, designed to address international policy issues of the day and brings together usually about 40 experts from different professions to brainstorm on problems urgently needing new solutions. So just to give a, a sense of the kinds of issues the uh, uh, foundation looks at, let me go through the titles of the three last conferences held this year. One on reform of the international economic architecture, a second one on countering radicalization in local communities, and a third one on the functions and purposes of modern diplomacy. Now, as for Sir Jeremy, his career has principally been with Her Majesty's diplomatic service, and he's held very senior and key posts, including U UK Special Representative for Iraq, Ambassador and UK uh, permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, Deputy Undersecretary for the Middle East and Eastern Europe, Assistant Undersecretary for Western and Southern Europe. As well, he's a board member of the International Rescue Committee and works as a special advisor to the British Petroleum Group. Further, he is the governor of the London Business School, which means that he has a good understanding of the business in which we're in. The title of his talk this morning is The World's Political Geology, Earthquakes Ahead? Question mark. He will assess the effectiveness of international institutions as national capitals become more assertive, as well as provide his views on the impact of Asia on the international scene. As one who has worked in three different international institutions, my students, some of whom are here, know my vocal criticism of the management of these institutions. I'm very eager to hear Sir Jeremy's views and hope that he, the talk will generate fertile ideas ripe for discussion afterwards. There will be no PowerPoint presentation. This is, uh, you know, Sir Jeremy is not an academic like us. We need props. We use PowerPoints. He will talk from his notes about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll take questions. It's all yours, sir. Thank you, Professor. I'm going to stand up and wander around just to give the, the cameras a bit of a challenge um, and um, try and replace uh, the habitual PowerPoint. Uh, we're trying to capture your interest uh, directly uh, with, yes, a Western view about global change uh, and how policymakers should really be responding to that. So we'll get into some of the questions that Pro Professor Javas has, uh, has outlined. Um, I do so with uh, very great respect for this school uh, and for its dean. It was Dean Mapubani who invited me here. We were on the Security Council together uh, from 2002 to 2003, just as Iraq was coming to the, to the boil. And Ambassador Mapubani was an example of a powerful diplomat from a smaller state having quite an effect in an international institution even though there was a P5 here and the emerging countries there and Iraq over there and lots of people. The voice of Singapore was heard in the Security Council during those two years because of the experience and the articulateness of your dean. So I'm very pleased to be here. We had dinner with him last night. Uh, he couldn't be here today because he's uh, engaged in something else. Uh, but he's probably heard much of what I've had been going to say anyway, so we'll uh, talk about it later. And it's very important, I think, to mix Western and Eastern views of the current agenda. 
what my foundation, the Ditchley Foundation, does is hold conferences once a month, basically on the theme of global change, what is the world doing, and how should policymakers respond to that. So what I'm going to go through with you in the next half an hour is what's happening underneath the surface. What are the global trends that you need to watch? Putting aside for a moment the short-term headlines. This is a Western view, so I'm going to talk a bit about how the West is failing to adapt as fast as the East to the new world and why. What has it got wrong? Then I'm going to look a bit at Asia and Asia's contribution to the new world and talk about the institutions that are on the rise, the institutions that are on the fade, and see what's coming. Why am I using the metaphor of geology? Because this is a period of quite dramatic and rapid change, and I think of it as one tectonic plate coming up and pressing the old one down as the forces of the earth move, and we need to see not just what is disappearing underneath, but what is appearing over the top, because that's the future. And the West is, to some extent, mired in the past. And why are these plates moving in the way that they are? Basically because of freedom. We could have a discussion later about the effects of the colonial era on a country like Singapore what it denied you, what it has left you, what kind of launching pad it gave you for the 21st century, and whether there are any historical emotions left from that. But the one thing that the United States in particular is the leader of the Western world, the leader of the free world, has done is create a larger area for democracy, open markets, economic opportunities, connection between continents, cross-border activity, and the spread of an information technology that you are all benefiting from. And I give maximum credit for that to the United States, whatever you think of some recent US policies that have affected you, either economically or politically, in your world. And that freedom has come along with the cliché of globalization, which has been proceeding since the Industrial Revolution, it's not new. But what is new in the combination of global economic activity and greater freedom is a shift in people's understanding of their own identity. This is an identity-driven world in its culture, its politics, its religion, and therefore in its attitude to the available opportunities and to the flow of information and the redistribution of power. And while the world is, is, uh, while the world is, is globalizing in economics and communication, it's tending to polarize in terms of identity and politics. We may have a freer space to operate in, but actually, as we get freer and more prosperous, our horizons narrow. And that is something that you need to calculate when you're looking at the underlying trends. The effect of this, as I see it, is to make nationalism, the old form of nationalism, more prominent and the multilateral institutions less powerful in the way that they operate against these flows of human opinion, positioning, emotion, and logic. And the response of humans to the new world of opportunity economically. Globalization, polarization, changes of identity make the national capital, because so many more actors are on the scene, so many more capitals have independent power to make the choices of policy that they want for their own people without having to respond to a power from outside, that it creates a completely new mix. 
And yet, nothing stands still for long. We need to see where that is going. Because if there are multiple actors out there, if everybody is competing for those opportunities, and the competition gets rough, in the business world, that leads to rationalization, to mergers, to powerful companies taking over huge areas of business. And that could happen politically as well. So we need to study the trends of what's happening at the global political level. Because... There's a paradox in what's happening in politics with the growth of the independent power of national capitals at the same time as the intensification of the freedom and the opportunity felt by individuals. So as the power shift is happening from the old Western bloc to a multi-active world, it's not another block taking over. It's the spread of power out to everybody, but some are going to take it with greater weight than others, of course. At the same time, on the vertical level, if you like, within societies, individuals, companies, municipalities, civil society, are all having a greater opportunity to look after their own affairs in their own way, with their own individual capability, all the way down to the individual level, than they had in any previous generation. So as the global political structure increasingly focuses on capitals, so capitals and their governments are leaking power out to the private sector, all the way down to individuals. So you've got a spread of power horizontally, a spread of power vertically, a plethora of new actors, and therefore a, an apparent jungle of different players under no particular world order that we've come together and agreed on. So we need to calculate what's happening in all of that and what the trends are underneath the surface. With the growing power in that first sense of capitals, the multilateral institutions tend to fade. The UN remains an immensely useful and indeed uh, global institution. But the UN in its intergovernmental capacity is the forum of member states. It's not a separate power center. It's a meeting place. And as a meeting place since the end of the Second World War, it has done a tremendous job in bringing to a small number of cases the amount of interstate fighting that is going on. What it is not so capable of dealing with, because the UN in its charter gives a very deliberate sovereign independence to each member state, is the conflicts that happen within states or because states have broken down in their government's capacity or in their attitude to their own people. And that has been the majority of conflicts we've had to deal with since the end of the Cold War in 1990. It began well with the first uh, handling of Iraq in 1991. Uh, but uh, it has gone through uh, the Great Lakes problems, Rwanda, the Balkan problems, Srebrenica, two big UN reports about the failure of the UN system to look after civilians in conflict. And through to the end of the 90s uh, and the beginnings of a great argument about Iraq, and in this last uh, decade, the conflicts in and over Iraq and Afghanistan, which has made the world look much more disturbed uh, than it might have done under the Cold War when power systems were frozen in that great rivalry between the two superpowers. In that change of events, in that flow of different trends, I think the West has got some things wrong. It's very difficult for the player that's been at the top of the heap for a while, for a long while, to recognize that something else is happening at the bottom of the heap, which it can no longer control. It resents that. And as the heap breaks up, expands, becomes 
uh, a freer collection of individuals, those new independent actors resent the attempt of the old boss to try and retain that bosshood. And the West has been very slow in realizing that and understanding that, particularly in the United States perhaps, as the big player, we called it the single superpower in the 90s. We wouldn't call it that today. We would be reluctant to use the term superpower at all today. It has anachronistic connotations. But today, the United States is still having trouble understanding that what it created, a new free space out there, has the freedom to choose to be anti-American. And the more that the West clings on to the fading appearance of its domination of the global agenda, the more the new creators of parts of the global agenda are going to do their own thing without reference to what happens in the West. And this is one of the reasons for the growing weakness of the institutions, which don't have any clear leadership. At the UN tend to be, in the General Assembly, a committee that is far too big to be an effective committee. You all work on committees of one sort or another in your own lives. I've come to the conclusion that anything uh, more than eight on a committee creates a less effective organization. If you try and work at 193, it cannot work. Too many different views. If you work within the Security Council at 15, it works a lot better, but there are still uh, 178 countries that are not on the Security Council and resent being bossed around by this apparent uh, anachronistic creation that still has five permanent members who, if the Security Council were created today, would not be the five holders of the veto. Yet you can't change the charter in one or two respects without opening up the charter to every wish for a change somewhere in it. And this is one reason why international institutions, multinational institutions, are on the whole unreformable. What is happening in international affairs is that ad hoc activity, the players who really hold the power, coming together in different ways to suit the subject that they're dealing with, to suit the power that is being exercised in the economic or the political or the environmental or the security or the trading area and trying to do deals in an ad hoc way. That is what we saw par excellence in Copenhagen over climate change. And it wasn't a pretty sight. It's happening all the time, actually, in the corridors of the UN. Always did, but it's happening in much more multifarious ways. The people are coming together, representatives of the particular states that have a stake in the issue being discussed and trying to sort things out in the corridors, informally, behind closed doors, in the way that the Security Council has always done in its informal consultations. But that's now happening in all sorts of bodies in many different ways. There isn't a standard order for the institutional settling of global problems now that there are so many more actors on the field. So just to recap, where is the power going? It's going away from the West, but the West still holds a great deal of impact, weight, influence, economic power, diplomatic and political power, and the United States is probably half the strength of military power in the whole globe in what it can project by way of uh, military power. But power's changed also. Uh, let me give you a, an example. Say we imagined, it's not literally true, say we imagined that the United States had 51% of global military power and 23% of global economic power and 10% of global political and diplomatic power and 2% of global moral authority, <laughs> where do you think 
it averages out. Increasingly, in a redistributed power scene in the world, soft power is becoming more important. Legitimacy is important. Being able to persuade people, not compel them to follow your ideas, is more important than at any time in global history. So the United States and Europe have to be conscious, and the UK is extremely conscious of this, that it can't just wave its military and its economic power and expect the rest of the world to follow. That is not a persuasive argument. And if you try and use your advant advantageous instrument of military power, as in Iraq or Afghanistan, you find it's not as effective in the first decade of the 21st century as it might have been in the last decade of the 19th century. And I think I'm giving you examples of how the world has changed. Iraq and Afghanistan were, from the United States and the United Kingdom's point of view, necessary actions to defend their own security. They were powerful enough. The UK was, of course, fiddling along behind the United States on this. The United States was powerful enough to use its military power 6,000 or 4,000 miles away in those two places in order to defend its own security, but produced reactions that undermined its power in other spheres, in its diplomatic appeal, political appeal, and in its moral authority or legitimacy. And that has been seen, we can discuss this, but that has been seen to undermine the moral authority, the power, the exercisable influence of the United States. We can go on to other examples, uh, but I won't spend time on this because we can discuss them. Uh, I think if we had a discussion of any length about the economic crisis, remembering that this was our crisis after yours 10 years ago in Asia, which you survived pretty well, uh, you're going to tell me, so I might as well tell myself, that it came out of the West, it came out of the United States as much as anywhere, it came out of the private sector, through bankers and finance companies inventing economic machinery, the workings of which and the value of which they didn't understand, until such a great amount of debt was created by trying to use one dollar to spin very fast to make it look like $70, that the system collapsed. Of course, when somebody started to call the debt in, which began with subprime mortgages, the whole thing unraveled. So that was built on sand when Western governments, including the UK government, felt that it was quite a sound, quite a prudent system that they'd created. They and the private sector did not understand the value of their own assets with the machinery that they'd created. That's our mistake, our crisis. It's affected you. I think in the first year of the economic crisis, the GDP of Singapore went down a good 5% or more. It certainly did in the UK, but it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your doing. That's what the world landed on you because of some poor decisions somewhere else. So in that sense, freedom, open markets, giving people their head, has its downsides unless there is some order in the system. Let's, let's just take a look at um, Asia's role in the new geography. Because we talk the whole time now about China and India, and of course, and Brazil, and Russia, and South Africa, and other players in the emerging economies. But I'm very interested in uh, Asia's response to the new opportunities of the 21st century and the new threats of the 21st century. Indeed, we're going to do a conference on this at Ditchley under Dean Mapubani's chairmanship in November. The implications of the growth of Asia in global politics. 
And of course, um, two new giants are, are, are growing out of Asian territory, China and India. Are they going to work together or are they going to be rivals? I suspect that they're going to be rivals on some things and they're going to work together on some things. It's not going to be an absolute choice between the one and the other. They're going to circle around each other, but they have a relationship with each other. They each have a relationship with the other countries of Asia. Japan is not going to sit silent while this goes on. And uh, at the ASEAN countries have already uh, collectively organized themselves to be quite a power in the global economy. Australia is wondering where to place itself. Then there's going to be the relationship between Asia and the rest of the world. Where is the United States going to be in the reshaping of Asian politics coming out of the new power of Asian economics? I suspect that the answer to the questions that Asians are beginning to ask about where they will be in, say, the first half of the 21st century, the answer is not going to be that Asia will form itself, rather like Europe did, into a solid, organized block, because you're a big continent of very different cultures. I suspect you're going to have uh, a multiplicity of different relationships, different opportunities, different decisions that will partly be Asian and, the, and you will want to feel the weight of Asia in global affairs but partly dependent on what happens in the world and how the United States places itself to make sure that India and China together don't dominate the whole of Asia or India and China don't go to war with each other. Or India, Japan, Australia and the United States offsets the growing weight of China. Or the China-US relationship goes positive from a slow start at the moment. And there's a G2, that, a number of different combinations. All I'm saying to you is that in this shift, this geologic shift of power, the United States will be a very important positive player in inter-Asian relationships, intra-Asian relationships. And that the weight of China and the weight of India will be qualified to some extent by something that they are conscious of, much more than uh, we realize in the West at least, the huge number of people in both those countries that live on or below the poverty line. Two-thirds of their population, roughly, in each country is not rich. They are not growing free and prosperous. India's democracy, China is not, so freedom has a different color in those two countries. But the relationship between the poor rural populations and the <coughs> growing middle classes of the urban populations are going to be very interesting as a phenomenon in both those countries going probably in different directions. I think of China as the ordered society that is chaotic underneath, potentially, and India as the chaotic shop window with an adaptability, a mental attitude that is more in tune with the 21st century. It would be very interesting to see how all that plays out, while the other countries of Asia will need to place themselves really quite carefully, hedging their bets as to where in Asia, in their part of Asia, and where in the world they place themselves, and which allies they go for at which times. What is the future of democracy in Asia? I imagine that you as Asians do not want particularly to copy Western forms of democracy. You want to live in countries where your government has your consent, whether you voted for them or not, whether it's a multi-party system or not. You want to live in a country that is ordered, that is safe, that is not chaotic 
in your daily life. So you want and you will pay for, with some of your freedom, a certain amount of order from your government. I think Singapore is a very good example of that. But you are increasingly going to become countries where the people have a voice. And you will have a voice whether your governments want you to have a voice or not, because you have media of expression through the internet, through the web, through the other forms of media, through your own ability to travel and interact and form your own collectives and express yourselves in every sense of that, that your government will not be able to control everything you do, even though it might want that greater control that all governments want and can't get because of this outward spread of freedom down to the individual. So why am I talking about earthquakes? What are the fault lines that I'm worried about? I'll just list them, and then we'll come back to a conversation. East-West, is that a fault line? It's a difference. We have different attitudes. We have different histories and different cultures. I'm not so sure that the fault lines are going to be east, west, north, south, Islam, Christianity, whatever. I don't think those are going to be the political fault lines where conflict is going to come. Certainly there will be hard argument. There will be extremists in all those areas who could at times be violent but they are not going to be the leaders or the main players or the setters of our opinions as individuals in an increasingly democratic space. What about um, the United States and the New World? It's new 21st, it's an irony for the New World country, the United States, to have to come to terms with the New World. Dvořák's New World was the beginning of the 20th century. This is a new century, and the United States is going to have to come to terms with a completely different world. There will be some strains and stresses on that when the United States gets angry or feels threatened. And Iraq and Afghanistan, and looking into the future, perhaps Iran, are going to be expressions of that. But I'm not sure that that's going to be the main fault line. Energy shortages, climate change, migration, all sorts of things are going to cause us trouble at a global level. Economic ups and downs. As we all learn to use the web and share each other's opinions, people will move to one side or other of the ship in great masses, and it'll list one way and then the other in economic terms. That's what's just been happening over the last two years. And the recovery from the economic crisis may be ver very strong and, and reach a new peak, particularly in Asia, uh, over the next two or three years, slower in Europe. I don't, still don't think that that is going to be the main fault line. I think the main fault line everywhere, including Asia, is going to be between governments and their own peoples in playing out this new sense of freedom for the individual. Governments that aren't seen by their own peoples to be realizing their potential. I see the Arab world as having problems in that score. A very talented, outward-looking, commercially-minded on the whole race of people whose governments in most countries in the Middle East and not allowing them the freedom, the space, the resources, the education, the travel opportunities to fulfill their own individual potential. That is going to create fault lines in Middle East countries. Within Iraq, within Palestine, those are the two growing democracies actually in the Middle East, you still see those fault lines. Within Israel, quite possible, and the in a sense, a mature democracy, but very polarized within itself, in Egypt, in Jordan, in Syria, in Saudi Arabia, where there are examples of greater repression, greater police control of society, 
It's a region I know better than I know East Asia, Southeast Asia. But there are going to be examples in Asia too of peoples reaching out economically and therefore having changed political views to want to feel that they have a different relationship with their government than they have now. I think China could be a prime example of that in time unless the people decide that they put order from a one-party system ahead of freedom, which could be, could be the answer. But the potential fault line is between governments and their own peoples. It makes things very unpredictable. I mean, these are the potential earthquakes. It could make the United States strike out when it feels particularly threatened. Iran is a possibility there. We could have examples of economic nationalism, of governments deciding not to trust the market for their supplies of oil. I don't see China at the moment as trusting the market. It's trying to do deals with Iran and Angola and other countries for direct supplies of oil when the global market is working perfectly efficiently. So efficiently that the United States in Saddam's day was buying 15% of Iraqi oil through the market. The economic nationalism is a potential earthquake. It could produce protectionism, the closing down of trade rounds, etc. And then there are the specific security issues. India-Pakistan is a story to be played out which will affect Afghanistan. Palestine, I've only just mentioned now, is stagnant and troubled to the point, I think, where we're close to a, another intifada over Jerusalem, a very dangerous boiling point, badly handled by the West in recent years. China and its neighborhood, China-Taiwan, the relationship between Japan and China. It's going to need great strategic patience to sort out some of these issues for there to be no conflict involved. But as our moderator pointed out, when I mentioned earthquakes in my title, I did put a question mark on it. I'm not saying you're going to have a rough time. I'm going to say we're all going to have a rough time unless there is a conscious effort to make the collective systems work. They may be happening more at the ad hoc multinational level than formally at the UN, but the machinery is there if we want to use it. It needs, above all, the United States to understand that and use the United Nations for its own long-term interests and not selectively for its short-term interests. It needs China and Russia to be more constructive in the United Nations than they are at the moment. It needs the voice of smaller countries to be heard because they have stakes. You have stakes in this new world. But it needs a system for all these voices to be heard, expressed, understood, and then answered. And that needs a political will, political leadership, which is only partly there at the moment. The wish is there. The actuality too easily goes back to national defenses, national prerogatives, sovereign independence, short-term jealousy. All those things are on the negative side of the line. I'm interested in hearing where you come out on this, so let's have a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was uh, really an exciting presentation, and uh, I, I, I don't have much disagreement, which is unusual. <laughs> so uh, with that, why don't, don't we open it up uh, for questions? Um, Simon Chesterman, formerly at the International Peace Academy, where I got to know uh, Sir Jeremy some time ago, now at the law school here, moving out with uh, Kishore. Um, thank you for a, a wonderful tour d'horizon. Um, the, the Concern I have is that the metaphor of geology on the one hand is a compelling one, but at the same time it suggests both the absence of human agency in creating problems and the difficulties, the enormous difficulties in present, preventing or ameliorating them. 
And so I wanted to pick you up on the, the very last comment you made about ad hoc multilateralism and how you might get to a situation where collective action problems like most prominently climate change can be resolved. As you said, committees work better when they're smaller, but we've always had a problem at the international level, and you've seen this in particular on the Security Council, with the idea that small groups of states can represent larger groups of states. I think it was you who once said that the Security Council can either be collective or responsible, but it was difficult to be both. So how do you see these ad hoc multilateral approaches dealing with larger collective action problems such as climate change? Through two potential routes, maybe they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, I agree with you that um, we've got a structural problem. Um, either through a hierarchy of organizations that pay uh, due, give due weight to the sub-regional, the regional, the fully continental organizations feeding into the UN system, or through imaginative leadership by certain powerful leaders, uh, not necessarily from the biggest countries, but if the biggest countries don't have leaders who are prepared to compromise and produce something for the collective, we're in trouble somewhere. And maybe you need both those things. I haven't, uh, for shortage of time really, haven't mentioned the regional organizations. The European Union in itself is a, what we sometimes call a postmodern experiment in regional collectivism. In fact, it's the most advanced uh, like-minded organization that the world has ever seen. But in its global reach, it's less than the sum of its parts because it's been so focused internally, obsessed, if you like, with its internal arrangements that it's not created as an outward-looking strategy. The smaller voices in the European Union have from my point of view, as a diplomat coming from a country uh, that has had a global history, like France, but unlike Germany or Italy or the smaller countries of Europe, can't compose a global strategy because there are too many members of that group that don't have a global view. And we proceed very roughly by majority, uh, by voting in the European Union. In Africa, you've got a strong, like-minded group in the African Union, but one which is very short of resources and instruments. In the Organization of American States, you've got a practiced collective club, which has sometimes been quite useful in handling regional, sub-regional conflicts, but which hasn't reached the degree of the European Union in its commercial trading economic, environmental arrangements, or in projecting political, diplomatic power. So we, we do have a problem in stitching together the various component parts of collectivism at the national, sub-regional, regional levels to make it fit with the UN level of a global forum. And that I see at the moment in the present period is falling apart rather than coming together. I think the world is becoming a mosaic of multipolar actors or at least uh, multi, a multiplicity of actors rather than forging a collective response to climate change or the world economy or the Doha round uh, or finance for development or developing world policy. It needs those regional organizations to become more effective, and it needs the regional organizations as a bunch to work together, and it needs the UN to come halfway to meet them to make all that work. That is the UN in its in intergovernmental capacity, so the same leaders at the UN coming down to meet themselves at the regional level and at the national level in a way which has some space left for the global good and not for their own national interests. The moment that is not tending to happen, and it probably needs a bigger 
crisis or a bigger accident that's happened in the last 20 years since the end of the Cold War, for that to start reforming towards the collective momentum rather than the vociferous momentum. The questions in the back. Well, Sir Jeremy, thank you very much. Oh, yes, my name is Anne. I just want to check with you. I may differ with your first initial introduction, in term of reference perspective of the West. I think that what you portray is very much a universal perspective, not really in the sense that you happen to be a Western. So I think here, as you notice in, in the context of religion, it is practiced by uh, human beings across countries in geographical, for that matter, uh, demographic-wise. So I think perspective is not just because Asian have to be Asian, must think Asian, and, and so I'm Singaporean, doesn't mean that I agree with what LKY have to say, or the school having you know, a backdrop of gray colors over their logo, which is questionable to me. No, I, I, I think that but this is perspective of individual. But the question is that the, the bigger component will depend whether you have originality or validity or you don't. So the question is realistically, are we realistic? And are we honest enough, like in the case of Iraq, for example, the superpowers are not willing to be honest of their dishonest. So the question is, you know, to say apology is a dirty word. So the question is that greed and manipulation, can we avoid and evade that? And completely, and I think that this question is that geographical here, we have, we have Chinese Singaporean, and uh, maybe they may regard China as a motherland. That's, that is their own personal perspective. But the question is that if they greed and they think that they win over that, I think that's going to be a problem. So I think here, I, I, would, I would say my observation about yours is entirely universal perspective. And I don't think that you should feel inferior or superior about it, but I think you're very kind about that. I appreciate it very much. Thanks. <laughs> if, say, there were two billion people in the world out of six and a half billion who all thought like you, they would be quite difficult to organize. <laughs> uh, even if you and I agree on many things, we together will be quite difficult to organize. And the cost of having structures that organize is quite strong on freedom. I, um, I accept what you say. Thank you. I've tried to be honest about Iraq. Uh, I have to remember, and if I don't remember, my wife tells me that I was for the invasion of Iraq as ambassador at the United Nations. Uh, I had to go out and implement the consequences of my own resolution 1483, which my Security Council colleagues were very amused by, because it doesn't normally happen to members of the Security Council, if you remember this, uh, having to go out and deal with the consequences of what they've proposed in the Security Council. Uh, but there has to be an understanding that freedom has its limits and responsibility is its concomitant. And if we can match responsibility to freedom, then we're getting somewhere. If we take the freedom and run away with it, then we're going into chaos. We're in a world that is getting used to the idea of freedom and therefore rather enjoying it and arguing with people who used to be their bosses, as it were, in the political sense. And the respect for politicians in, in Europe, in my country, has gone down in the last 10 years, generically, not just for individuals. Politicians are having a bad time. Journalists are having a bad time being respected. Diplomats are having a pretty bad time. <laughs> but we deserved it to some extent. We must, I mean, it comes back to Simon's question, we must find a way of putting the collective above the individual, and, and then we're getting somewhere. If do you had a question. Iftikhar Chaudhary, uh, ISATS. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for an extremely interesting uh, expose. Uh, you, uh, uh, you mentioned Iraq, of course. I mean, uh, when we were concerned about uh, when you heard that stuff happens, yours was a voice of, voice of reason and, uh, and stability. And uh, we are very grateful for the role that you performed out there as, as Britain's representative. Uh, 
Uh, the fault lines, yes, you are wise to put a question mark, wise as usual, because uh, uh, I suspect that uh, what we have learned from the British, the art of muddling through, we will somehow muddle through the, these issues, these fault lines. One of the, uh, one issue though, which you did not mention, uh, which is a bit worrisome, is in the area of non-proliferation. Uh, in, in, the, in the Cold War era, there was a predomin uh, predominant, this thing of deterrence uh, 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 doctrine, which sort of uh, held uh, a, a kind of equilibrium between, between, uh, between uh, the two uh, major powers. Today, we see a multiplicity uh, poles of, of nuclear powers. In May, we are going to have a review of the NPT. Now, we are going to handle these new uh, uh, nuclear actors, India, Pakistan, et cetera. Is there some way you think these could be accommodated in a way that within the international system or organization, we could create a, some kind of a uh, balanced stability with these newer uh, uh, players playing a role which is uh, stabilizing? You're quite right. I, I should have um, brought uh, proliferation into the equation. Ambassador Chowdhury was also on the Security Council uh, with Ambassador Mapubani and myself in 2002 3, uh, also reminding me in quiet corners that we weren't necessarily going in the right direction. Um, I didn't mention terrorism either. But there's a difference between the problem of terrorism and the problem of uh, proliferation. That terrorism, although the West makes uh, a lot of noise about it, necessarily, I think, because 9-11 uh, was an extraordinary attack on the United States. And in my country, terrorism is coming out of the streets of the United Kingdom rather than from abroad. It's a homegrown thing uh, from people of our community, even though they may be of the Islamic faith, even though their grandparents may have lived in Pakistan or the Caribbean or whatever. Uh, but they come from inside because terrorism of that kind, of the Al-Qaeda kind, is not an existential threat. It is a lethal menace but it's not going to destroy our societies. They want, uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, Osama bin Laden, wants to create a new political order in the Middle East. That would be existential for some Middle Eastern countries. But terrorism in itself is not going to be an existential threat. It's just going to be an absolute menace and sometimes lethal. Proliferation of nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction is an existential threat. And the combination of terrorism and proliferation could also be an existential threat. Iran uh, then has to come into your question because Iran is the test of whether we do we, whether somebody does the ultimate to stop Iran becoming the ninth or tenth holder of nuclear weapons power after the P5, India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea off to the side uh, with a crude nuclear capacity but not a great potential to project power beyond its own borders, but it has missiles. Iran has developed a missile program. It is having trouble developing uh, enriching uranium to nuclear weapons grade. It's still the teens or the, the 20s in its enrichment capability, it needs uh, 80 to 90 percent uh, enrichment purity of uh, uh, uranium to get nuclear weapons. But, uh, and it's still not proven, uh, we have to be careful having made a mistake over Iraq, it's still not proven that Iran is truly driving for nuclear weapons capability. I think it's going for the scientific capability and will stop there and make a decision whether to go further, whether to weaponize it. A very dangerous step for Iran. Dangerous enough even to enrich to that degree. But there's an, another part of the answer to your question, Ifti, which is do India, Pakistan, Israel, 
feel have the same responsibility for guarding their nuclear weapons capability as the P5. They are not in the same relationship to the non-proliferation treaty, uh, for instance, under Article 6, as the P5. It's, it's hugely good news that President Obama wants to discuss how to get weapons down to zero. For the United States to have a president who's asking that question, even though it may take a putative 100 years to do so, and therefore have no bearing on the immediate future, is sending things in the right direction. The United Kingdom certainly is prepared to scale down, but none of the nuclear powers, none of those eight, are prepared to go down to zero unless, A, they all go down to zero together, because otherwise the last man holding it has the advantage, and it's not possible for anybody else to suddenly spring up and say, ha-ha, I was hiding them all the... So <laughs> there needs to be uh, an efficiency of international control which has not yet come out of the MPT. I hope this review conference this year will be better than 2005, which was a disaster. Even so, it will not produce immediate movement uh, towards the fulfillment of all the elements of the MPT. It's just got to reverse the downslide since the last one. And we have a very serious set of propositions to look at over the next 20 years or so to prevent a rush to nuclear civil capacity leading to nuclear weapons uh, attempts by other states if Iran gets there and is allowed to get there. I don't like either of the binary choices in Iran, either Iran getting nuclear weapons or a military strike against Iran. Both have huge downsides. I think particularly the latter, actually, given the, the world that I've described to you. But Iran has to choose to be responsible, or I think Iran is going to be in quite deep trouble over the next two or three years. Hello, my name is Paula Murphy-Ives. And just picking up from that question, I was thinking that on that March 13th announcement of Obama to step down on nuclear weapons, you could say that maybe the US moral authority went up to 3%. But my question is, who, where's the rest of that 97, 98%? And if power is diffused, as you say, along the vertical, up to the top and down to the individual through the nation state, who, where do you see the individual or the NGOs or the WWFs and going right up through the nation state? Wh who's going to carry that moral authority and the leadership that we need to get all of these issues that are being raised addressed? And that's my question. I've often been asked this question when I use that table of, of figures about the United States. And we all need to puzzle about it because it's not clear that it's gone anywhere, that, that there is any general moral authority. We each choose our own, our own model, if you like, our own ideal leader or our ideal ideology or ideal pragmatism. I'm not sure that there is any moral authority that is just up there at an apex. I think actually even the concept of leadership in the world has changed. Leadership in, in a very open and interconnected world is not an apex thing. It's a circular thing. You are sometimes leading your people. You're sometimes following what they want. And you need to know at which point of the cycle you are as a leader to have an understanding of how you relate to your followers. There's no point in being a leader if nobody's following you because you don't have that aspect of legitimacy. It's no point always saying, I'm here to lead you. What do you want me to do? Which some leaders do do in a democracy. <laughs> Or they, they look at the polls, and my private polls say I'm a pretty good chap, even if the public polls say that it's a mess. Um, I think the United States could immediately, I'll come back to the 2%, but I, I can immediately raise its moral authority if it shows an understanding that the countries, the, the leaders who need to contribute most to the collective system that I'm saying is... 
necessary to regenerate are the biggest powers. Those with the power must contribute more to the collective system that looks after those that don't have the power. Therefore, there's got to be a bigger contribution from the United States into the developing world at the official level. The US is the most generous donor at the private level of all. It is one of the least generous of the major donor nations at the official level in terms of percentage of GDP. And it's not just the amount of money that goes into the developing world. It's showing an understanding that the developing world has a voice, which it failed to do, perhaps, at Copenhagen. So did China, so did India, so did Brazil, actually. So the moral authority hasn't gone to them. In making the Doha round work, particularly in the agricultural sector in the developing world, so that there is trading access for agricultural products in the developing world. The US and Europe haven't contributed enough to that at the moment. I think that the moral authority of the United States has risen with the arrival of President Obama. I, I'm using a figure from the President Bush era in my mind. <laughs> uh, I may be biased, but I think most people are biased about the difference between President Bush and President Obama as far as global understanding is concerned, I'm not talking about domestic US. So I think the US, as the most powerful country, as the country that will be the most powerful country for maybe a bit longer than you might think, because China, India, Russia, Brazil all have internal problems, um, has got to give the most. But China needs to be more constructive. Russia needs to be more constructive. We remember on the Security Council, these were two powerful players on the Security Council, particularly Russia. But Russia had a destructive power. It wasn't ever in the room when we were trying to find that muddly way through, which the Brits are good at, because they haven't got the power to be anything else but muddly. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're quite good at the muddly stuff, actually. And governments generally are pretty bad at it. We had an advantage. <laughs> we did some for the United States, you remember. Uh, the United States has the power, which we don't have. We have the muddly stuff, which they aren't very good at. I'm Canadian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Um, my name is Jessica. I'm a student from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I have two short questions. Um, the first one relates to the debate in Copenhagen. Uh, it's about how relevant is Europe to US. And um, there are quite some interesting comments, but I would like to know your views on that. The second question is about um, the euro area. We all know that the euro area is now under distress. And my professor, Charles Adams, mentioned that the Brits would love it because they would just chuckle behind and say, you know, we did the right thing not to jo join the euro area. So um, despite the fact that you are British, uh, we, we want to know uh, how you see the future of the euro area. Thank you. Thank you. On transatlantic relations, um, North America, Western Europe, North America, European Union, I've just come actually from something called the Brussels Forum. The German Marshall Fund of the United States sets up a sort of mini Davos for transatlantic policymakers and ac academics and journalists and people in Brussels every spring. And uh, I've just come to Singapore from there. And you'd be amazed uh, how good the North Americans and the Europeans are at loving each other when they get together once a year. <laughs> and then they go away and forget, out, forget about each other altogether for the other 51 weeks. Um, it's, it's neither the one nor the other. I think North America, to some extent, takes uh, Europe for granted. Europe behaves in a way which allows itself to be taken for granted. France is quite good at being uh, cussed when it feels like it. But <laughs> Europe as a whole, and Brit Britain in particular, uh, it never likes to be really sort of angry with the United States. It's, you know, you don't go and prod gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> um, so France is often more courageous but less realistic than, than most of us. Um, the EU is a very 
interesting and powerful organization. But it hasn't got its weight together politically and diplomatically yeah. in terms of global strategy. It is a poor strategic player. It's a very powerful economic, mm. trade, environmental uh, player. And it is a wonderful example of a continent that has dealt with the business of intracontinental war once and for all out of our two horrible experiences in the 20th century. The United States used to be a European power up to the end of the Cold War, literally. Not just for its bases, but its politics was rooted in Europe as far as its global outreach was concerned, because the other superpower was just the other side. Once that superpower disappeared, the US became global and the EU became less, relatively less important to the US because China and other places became more important. But when the United States is in trouble on something, when it needs support, when it has to puzzle something out, it comes straight to Europe. And the private discussions that go on are actually very strong. The relationship is, uh, we often say, based on values and shared history and approaches and, and blood because the US is mostly made up of European ethnic origin. But the United States increasingly has a different global view from Europe. And because that's what, what is coming to the surface the whole time in daily diplomatic activity, you see less of the relationship. But underneath, it's actually stronger. Britain is actually a member of the EU. <laughs> it's not a member of the Euro. And we're quite pleased about that at the moment, because we don't have to bail out Greece. Um, <laughs> In fact, we might quite like the uh, euro to bail out Britain. But, uh, <laughs> um, it's going to be interesting if a Conservative government comes in when we have an election, uh, probably in May, because the, um, the Conservatives are even more sceptical about Europe than uh, the Labour Party. And the majority of British public opinion is, at the moment, quite sceptical mm -hmm. about Euro the concept of Europe as a political union. But we won't go in that direction. But actually, I don't think Germany or Poland or Latvia or Greece you know, really want to go in that direction either. So we're not alone in that. And I think that there will be a pragmatic relationship between Britain and the EU. And we are players in the trading area, in the environmental area, on economic policy when it's not just Eurozone, Britain actually has no choice but to be a firm member of the European Union. The United States is not interested in Britain being outside the European Union, and therefore the British people, to some extent, will have to be pragmatic about this, and if they're over-skeptical, come to their senses, because it's quite an important choice for the UK. Okay, I'll take one final question before we close. went off again. Um, I ad want to address some of the economic uh, things that are happening. I, a number of people are very concerned at the rhetoric now coming out of the U.S. Senate and the Congress about uh, uh, Chinese renminbi revaluation and uh, the possibility of putting on trade barriers. Um, and with the strong possibility that we're not out of the uh, economic crisis in the West and especially the U.S., um, I think they're more prone to, to have some knee-jerk reactions uh, uh, coming up to the midterm elections. Could you play out the possible scenarios that will happen there and how likely they are to uh, proceed? Yes, certainly. Um, you're right. I skated over in my sort of earthquake zone, um, economic disruption, etc., without getting into the areas you've described, which are very important. Um, the revaluation of the renminbi um, and detachment from the dollar would be quite a dramatic event if it was done suddenly. Uh, it would affect the dollar as a, as a world reserve currency. Uh, nevertheless, it would be justified by trade performance at the moment. Um, balances between nations are out of kilter 
with the current exchange rates, particularly in that area. Uh, Japan is historically uh, still going through a weak period economically, but Japan has some strength, I think, to refine. The other countries of Southeast Asia uh, will contribute to trading strengths and therefore imbalances with Europe unless Europe and North America can grow faster than they're coming out of the recession at the moment. So there, there are considerable tensions to manage here. And the management of them has moved from the G7 to the G20. But the G20 is not yet a form building. It's a building site. We don't know what's going to come out of the G20. Anyway, 20 is a bit of a metaphor. It's 24 because so many Europeans crowd through the door at the last minute that it always gets more than 20. And different countries, even 20 is too big a committee, different countries form the core block as to whether you're talking about trade or financial imbalances or the environment or development. It's a different team at the table very often. I think one underlying truth at the moment as far as China's economic performance is concerned is that its growth out of the economic recession is very much dependent still on American consumption. Let me give you one quite startling, as we know it all, but it's startling to remember it, straight statistic. China and India contribute about 40% of the world's population and they have a consumer sector, cons consumption of goods amounts to $2.5 trillion a year. The United States has 4.5% of world population and its consumption amounts to $10 trillion a year. So if China and India had the consumption strength of the United States, they would have a consumption area of $25 trillion a year. At the moment, they have 2.5. China and America are dependent on each other. America as the trade draw for Chinese exports. China as the investor in the dollar and in the American economy. I see them bound together, perhaps slightly unhappily, like a three-legged race. But they've still got to proceed together in the near term until something happens. China has had an opportunity to revalue the renminbi. It hasn't happened. It's too disruptive, which gives you an idea of China as a player that doesn't want to cause explosions, at least at the moment, until perhaps it's stronger. But I'm of a mind to think that China may never want to cause big explosions unless you touch its absolutely vital interests. So I see a, a, an uneasy but a continuing relationship there, perhaps a slow, gradual move of the renminbi against the dollar. Other sovereign wealth funds having to come at a smaller level, perhaps, to similar conclusions, but the UAE has dollar reserves almost amounting to China's. Ch uh, Russia has got choices to make about diversifying its economy, which is much too dependent on oil and gas at the moment, and therefore on energy pricing. So you've, you've got everybody having to make relative choices. And at the moment, because the economic crisis has been quite scary, but in the long term, China feels its power that the world is coming its way, I believe that all these players will play things quite slowly over the next few years until they see what happens and what the consequences of the consequences will be of their throwing their weight around. So I think no earthquakes this year on that one. But I don't know about the further future. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, tour d'horizon. But I would also like to point that uh, I agree very much with the notion that one of the fault lines is going to be the tension between governments and their own people. This is something that we see in the neighborhood. The regional organizations have not been very helpful. Uh, 
We always hear that lots goes on behind doors, none of it comes to the front. Uh, and this is not only in countries where the systems are not democratic, it's also in countries where, where democracy exists. I'll give the example of Turkey where this kind of tension right now is very, very strong. And I'm not sure whether the multinational, um, the um, multilateral organizations will be able to, to help change the situation, but I think it is going to be a, a major problem that, w that the world will face in the coming years. Thank you very much for a very exciting talk.